Do you find yourself worried about every and all emergencies that occur on a plane? Or even if you're just interested to find out why most problems labeled as emergencies are not that at all? Well, this is the video for you. Following the success of the turbulence and aircraft noise videos, I've decided to add this video to the series. It is one that I've been wanting to make for a while now, and it actually relates to when I moved from flying single engine aircraft to multi-engine aircraft for the first time. I wanted to share with you five aircraft problems that are classed as emergencies, but why you don't need to worry about them as much as you think. We'll look at what the issue is and what mitigations are in place to make it safer and ultimately a bit of an inconvenience more than a worry. Before I get bombarded with comments telling me that these are serious situations, I do agree. There will definitely be a sense of urgency and a higher level of risk, but nowhere near what you expect and I'll show you why. A comment would be appreciated though, if you have the time. One final caveat is that there will be events where these problems have led to not so positive results, but that will usually be a combination of events or actions surrounding the actual emergency. I want to share with you the safety features and mitigations to these emergencies that turn them into an inconvenience rather than a truly dreadful situation. With all that said, let's move on to the first emergency loss of power or electricity. So electricity is a fundamental part of modern day aircraft, from keeping the lights on, powering the screens for the pilots and the passengers, or more importantly, powering the actuators that control the aircraft, or even being able to fly the plane using electronic signals. Modern airliners are built on a series of redundancies, and the electrical system is a great example of this. The aircraft has a series of generators that produce electrical power, now these generators are in both engines and in a small engine called the auxiliary power unit at the rear of the aircraft. Under normal conditions, the electrical power will be generated solely by the generators in the engines. But in the unlikely events that one of these engines was to fail, the aircraft would lose the power generated by the generator or generators in that engine. In these situations, the APU can be started to assist with the electrical load. And in terms of electricity, the aircraft can continue as normal. If you take this a step further and say that both engines were to fail and the APU failed to start, this still doesn't mean an end to all power. The aircraft has batteries that are able to power the basic components for a short amount of time. It's safe to say at this point that the in-flight entertainment would be off, but the aircraft would still be able to fly using its basic components. This obviously isn't an ideal situation, but even if all this was to happen, the aircraft has a further device that produces electricity if all the generators fail. This is something called a ram air turbine. And this turbine is automatically released when the aircraft detects that it has experienced a loss of power. This turbine will be released into the airflow and similar to a wind turbine, will use this airflow to turn the turbine and provide power to the essential components of the flight. An additional point to this is that if the generators were to fail and the aircraft was only running on emergency power, the engines would still work and run independently of the electrics. It doesn't require power to keep running once it has been started. Next up, number two, and this is brake failure. As we all know, once an aircraft lands, it needs to be able to stop. The aircraft will use its brakes to do this, among other things. So if the main brakes were to fail, there are several other systems that come into play. Along with the main brakes, the aircraft will deploy spoilers to increase the drag and to put increased pressure on the wheels and brakes. It also has the option to use reverse thrust to slow the aircraft down. On top of all of this, the brakes have an emergency brake system that will allow them to continue to work even when the main brakes have technically failed. Under normal circumstances, the brakes will be operated through a hydraulic system. But if the hydraulics fail, causing this brake failure, then there is a brake accumulator which is pressurized but sealed with a one-way valve, meaning that if pressure is released from the system due to the failure, the pilots are still able to use the brakes stored in the brake accumulator using the parking brake to stop the aircraft. Moving on to number three, and this is landing gear failure. So if the gear was to fail to release and drop down when the crew used the gear lever, they have another option. They can opt to use the manual release handle and this will unlock the landing gear doors and depending on the type of aircraft, whether it's using hydraulics or electrics, it will release the hydraulic pressure holding the gear up 
and gravity will be used to lower the gear. Again, in some instances, the airflow can be used to assist the pilots when they yaw the aircraft left and right to allow additional pressure on the gear to lock it into place. And for the nose gear, there will be springs in the system to provide additional forward momentum to lock them into place. Moving on to number four, and this is engine failure. Now this is the one where I realized multi-engine aircraft have a much different way of operating compared to single engine aircraft. When I was in the early stages of flying training, I was flying a single engine turboprop. This meant that any time there was an issue relating to the engine, you had to be quick and decisive, almost instantly looking for an appropriate place to land. And this usually led to looking for an attractive field to land in. This urgency was further compounded when you were flying low level. Fast forward to the early stages of my multi-engine flying training, and that mentality was still in place. Any time we practice an engine issue, I was acting with much more urgency than what was required. It is still a serious situation, but one that is fully understood and aircraft are designed and pilots are trained to withstand. One thing that I think demonstrates the effectiveness of modern aircraft and engines is something called ETOPS. This stands for Extended Range Twin Engine Operation and is a certification aircraft can receive which determines how far they can travel on one engine. The reason this was important when it was introduced was because it determined how far aircraft could fly from an appropriate airfield on their routes. Originally this was set at 60 minutes, which meant that aircraft flying over more remote areas needed to fly within 60 minutes of other airfields the entire way, completely changing their flight path. This is why transatlantic airliners would usually have four engines as this rule didn't apply to them. As aircraft engines have become more efficient and reliable, aircraft will now receive individualized ETOPS ratings, which will determine how far they can travel on one engine. An example of this is Boeing's 777 or 787s have an ETOPS of 330 minutes, and the new Airbus A350-900 has been certified for an ETOPS rating of 370 minutes, meaning that it can fly on one engine for over six hours. This means that it can fly directly to most places on Earth, apart from maybe over some parts of Antarctica. So most modern airliners can fly for hours on a single engine, but what about when they catch fire? Well, this does make things a little bit more serious, but there are methods to deal with this as well. Firstly, the crew are able to starve the engine of fuel, which can stop the fire from burning. Also, aircraft engines will have fire extinguishers in them allowing the pilots to extinguish the flames within the engine. In some situations, especially during takeoff, the pilots may decide to keep the engine running even if it's producing fire, because it's also still producing thrust. It will make for a worrying scene, that's for sure, but this will allow the aircraft to reach a safe altitude before the engine is shut down and the aircraft returns to the airfield. On top of all this, aircraft engines can also be restarted mid-flight. If the time or conditions allow, the pilots can decide to restart the engine or just safely and comfortably continue flying on one engine. Pilots will regularly train to take off and land with one engine, something known as asymmetric flight, meaning that the aircraft is not producing symmetric thrust. With the assistance of the rudder and trim, these asymmetric forces are simply cancelled out and the aircraft will feel like it's flying normally. Overall, while an aircraft outage can be potentially alarming for those on board, modern airline technology ensures that it should never cause anything other than a mild inconvenience. Now finally, moving on to number five, and this is decompression. This one's a bit more serious, and in the early stages, I would consider this a serious emergency, but it very quickly becomes a very mild to minimal problem. I decided to add it in as there are many actions the aircraft and the pilots take to mitigate any further problems. So the main issue with decompression is that humans require oxygen to breathe, but there isn't enough to sustain human life at 36,000 feet. Hopefully this news doesn't surprise you. The way the aircraft gets around this is by pressurizing the aircraft to a simulated lower altitude of 8,000 feet, where humans can comfortably sit for hours without having any negative effects. If a plane experiences a rapid decompression at height, let's say 36,000 feet, then a person has about 20 seconds of useful consciousness. 
and then will lead to unconsciousness without any symptoms, but this will fluctuate depending on the person. This is the reason why you are told to put your oxygen mask on yourself first before helping others, as the effects of hypoxia are rarely felt and very soon you struggle to carry out basic tasks. So that all sounds very serious, and it is, but it's only temporarily. There are systems on the aircraft that are constantly monitoring the pressurization of the cabin. If this falls outside the normal parameters, the pilots will be warned and something called an emergency descent will be carried out. This means that the crew will get the aircraft to 10,000 feet or below as quickly as possible. This will be done by lowering the nose of the aircraft, bringing the thrust to idle and increasing the drag on the aircraft as much as possible by using spoilers and speed brakes to allow for the quickest rate of descent without accelerating the aircraft outside of its structural limits. Included with this, the crew will squawk emergency and they will inform air traffic control. This way traffic can be moved out of the way and the crew will have their own oxygen masks that they will be wearing to keep them oxygenated and not becoming hypoxic. This will feel quite sporty with the aircraft pitching down a lot, but this is all part of the procedure to get to a safe, breathable altitude. As I mentioned earlier, this is why oxygen masks are deployed as it negates the effects of hypoxia. They will last around 12 to 20 minutes, and this is plenty of time to get down to 10,000 feet or below. Even if you were to miss the mask and pass out, you would regain consciousness within around 20 seconds after reaching a safe altitude if done quickly. I have experienced hypoxia before in a training exercise designed to show you the effects, and it's crazy how confident you become at performing a task you are getting progressively worse at. It also showed the importance of oxygen masks and being able to spot the effects of hypoxia if needed. Once the aircraft levels at or below 10,000 feet, it will then continue to its diversion airfield and will be able to be flown as normal. Another big safety feature of this issue is that the aircraft will perform this maneuver automatically if there is no action from the crew. Once it has detected the loss of pressure, it will warn the crew. If they do nothing, the aircraft will then start to descend to 10,000 feet, both making a turn to let air traffic control know what has happened, and once it has reached a safe altitude, it will potentially follow an escape route which comes into play when the aircraft is over mountainous areas. When the tops of those mountains are near or above 10,000 feet, the aircraft will fly a pre-planned route avoiding those mountains. For those of you that have watched more of my videos, I do see the irony of one day posting a video talking about how safe aircraft are and then the next I post an air crash investigation. But I feel both of these are related. So much information and safety regulations are created from these aircraft accidents and incidents. Flying is safer than it has ever been before, and that is due to a culture that is constantly evolving and learning from events. I just wanted to share these emergencies and their actions with you, as most people will be afraid of what they don't know. Hopefully you can now be armed with some information to make these situations, however unlikely, a little bit more comfortable. If you would like me to look into any other issues or emergencies, just let me know in the comments as there is always an opportunity to make a part two of this video. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.